Good morning, Monday the 10th of February. I hope everyone in the UK made it through the, the stormy weekend. Uh, but back to, to business Monday morning, a look ahead for the, the week, not just the session ahead. Uh, and what have we got? So normal routine. Uh, I'll talk about some of the, the key fundamental themes that are going to be in focus, at least from our point of view. And then I'll hand you over to Sam who will go over the charts both uh, intraday and for the week from a technical perspective. And if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. We'll be doing these updates throughout the week. So this is the, uh, the calendar of main events. But before I um, jump into that uh, and discuss a couple of key points of interest, let's just have a quick cross check on still the subject, which is dominating a lot of the uh, kind of national mainstream as well as financial media and that is the ongoing situation in mainland China and the coronavirus. So here is the live uh, John Hopkins mapping data. Uh, so total confirmed cases now just over 40,000 and the death tally now at 910 so it does indeed now uh, eclipse that of the SARS virus in 2002-2003. Total recovered numbers being reported around 3,000 400. Now, a couple of interesting things that have developed on the back of this, uh, which has drawn a few headlines this morning. For one, this was the uh, basically the head, the director general of the World Health Organization uh, came out and made some comments um, from overnight. So if, let me just go back onto his Twitter account. So obviously, just like uh, the way other senior um, or influential people these days communicate to markets uh, is via their Twitter account uh, and the World Health Organization no different. So there was one particular comment, I did have it up, let me just see if I can find it quickly. But he was basically making a, a, a reference to this being the tip of the iceberg potentially just in terms of the actual numbers uh, in regards to the ongoing coronavirus and that obviously coming from someone of that stature and related to the ongoing monitoring of this has seen a little bit of attention, a bit of a blip down at the reopening of trade. However, when you actually look at the charts this morning, you can see that we've seen a pretty decent recovery after that initial opening price. So once again, um, I do feel like uh, the media fanfare around this is still in full swing. However, from a market's perspective, it's still a lot more uh, rational and response uh, in that respect and I think that is you know what we're seeing on the charts in front of us at the moment. Um, a few other things over the weekend that probably warrant a mention though on this point. Uh, one is a lot of studies coming out now apparently about the um, when can we get when will we see peak virus as to then ascertain when can uh, almost China go back to, to business as usual uh, and mid to late February seems to be uh, the most common kind of time frame. Uh, there are other mixed reports saying that the coronavirus may uh, infect up to around half a million people in the end at that point. Um, however, on the flip side, the executive director of the World Health Organization's health emergencies program did also say that there had been a stabilization in the number of cases reported from Hubei. If you remember, that is the area specifically which encapsulates then uh, the apparent origination in the city of Wuhan. And they have seen in the data a four-day stable period where the number of reported cases has not advanced. So that's per the graphic I'm just showing you at the moment. So this is the kind of thing that they're, they're looking for is this just general natural leveling off. Uh, as those who have the immunity to it and have recovered then uh, and with the containment of locking down the city for the period that they have done for now coming up to what almost two weeks or so uh, do we start to see a leveling off uh, in that respect. A um, couple of other things a few people mentioning the fact that um, some Chinese factory uh, kind of blue collared workers returning uh, to their posts today. Uh, one was Foxconn, which is particularly important because obviously that has uh, kind of a chain effect into large US corporations like Apple, for example. Um, but 
one of the things here from a, a white collars perspective, many being asked to work from home, and there's still various different differences to the, uh, the, the different provinces, if you like, in China as to their proximity and number of reported cases and whether or not it is a full return to work as yet. But this obviously is quite key because the longer that they remain on, on full lockdown, the more severe the implication on their economic activity. However, if you put them back to work and it's seen as uh, too premature, then obviously that could then re ignite then the transmission from human to human cases because people are then able to spread the disease or outbreak more effectively and so yes yeah, quite it's quite an interesting time for it uh, whether or not uh, we start to see the next escalation of it or we remain as we are at the moment i think at the moment markets remain fairly sanguine and and i think that's the way you've got to look at this almost kind of objectify the situation try not to get too caught in the conspiracy theories circling on Twitter and just focus on what it is that's moving charts at the moment. And I, I still try to look at this type of thing as binary as possible. Uh, and unless the outbreak numbers start to, to manifest themselves, A, outside of China, and B, once they do start to return to work, if that starts to see another new exponential rise in number of cases, meaning that they're going to have to reclose uh, a number of significant populous areas of the country which is going to have big economic impact on the country now unless that unfolds i still don't think that this is a particularly massive issue for markets not to say that that could change though in the future but that's the current status quo i'd say um, the other thing that few people have looked at is overnight you have some inflation data out of china i don't think it comes as a massive surprise uh, Chinese consumer inflation hit its highest level in more than eight years in January due to the impact of the virus outbreak and the Lunar New Year. So normally we do see a seasonal blip um, given the complete country shutdown for the Lunar New Year. But given the extension of that with the virus mean, meant that consumer prices in China climbed 5.4% in January from a year earlier, the highest reading since October of 2011. Food prices grew 20.6% from a year earlier. Pork prices were up 116% on the year in January. Because remember, before this, food prices were already elevated on the back of the, um, the swine flu that was creating a cull on a large scale of pigs, which saw a big boost in those prices for a while. So it's almost exacerbated of what was already an ongoing inflationary issue in terms of the divide between uh, divergence of CPI and PPI uh, in that extent. So that will likely continue for now. Um, some other headlines to cycle you through, and then a few thoughts on the week on the calendar. Um, we did have Irish elections uh, at the weekend. You've probably read a little bit about this. The, the main thing here that I want to stress is that this isn't this doesn't have any immediate market implications, uh, at least not for now. Uh, but what has happened is Sinn Féin ballot box revolution rocks the Irish establishment. So what otherwise is very much a two-party system, kind of like in most countries, if you think about it, Britain the same. You know, if you had the Labour and Conservatives, but you know, both parties almost diminishing in their... Uh, their interest had been, the, for the recent few years, a bit of a pattern until Boris obviously got this commanding majority, and that has led to things like populism, Brexit party, or even a brief stint for some other parties on the more um, kind of pro-European, Liberal Democrat side, so some popularity at one point. Uh, but the, you know, a, a common thing that's been seen, and a continuation of that in Ireland, so uh, Sinn Féin, which... Uh, does draw some eyebrows given its historical connections to the IRA and left-wing policies. Uh, the Nationalist Party now will now go into potentially coalition talks. Uh, that's not to say that they're going to have the outright control here. Both parties, um, both the existing main established parties, argue Sinn Féin's mix of nationalism and populism are unsuitable for office. So both had previously said they'd be unwilling to go into any type of uh, cooperation or coalition government with them. However, um, Fianna fail, falls or fails Michael Martin accepting his obligation to find a functioning government 
uh, could well uh, break that that traditional mold. Um, one of the main things here is, you know, why why has populism been, you know, nationalism such a prevalent theme of late? Well, Brexit is a particularly striking issue, of course, when it comes to Ireland in particular, uh, and that of co that of course has had some implications here, but. Uh, other familiar policies, taxing the wealthy, lowering the retirement age, uh, bigger spending program in decades on housing, uh, have all been very popular things of a country which, don't forget, was the recipient of a, a sovereign bailout only within the last decade as well and has gone through a strong period of austerity, then Brexit. I don't think it's much of a surprise to see a more uh, national party coming through uh, and being more popular in this current economic or political climate. Going back though to the, the calendar for the week, uh, one thing that I just wanted to mention here was um, we continue to monitor for any ongoing comments out of OPEC Plus. Will they or won't they cut supply? Uh, oil, I'll leave from a technical point of view for Sam to look at, but it's trading back basically at a $50 handle, so still threatening quite a key significant point. Uh, and one thing that I thought was interesting from what I was reading at the weekend was at the moment you've got a bit of a standoff, the Saudi want to act, but Russia not so sure on the timing and haven't really made any firm commitment either way as yet. But one thing that was happening over the weekend was a, uh, a meeting in Cairo and this was peace talks that were happening. Now Libya, uh, this is in respect to Libya specifically. Now Libya in the last few weeks, as per this graphic that you can see, this is looking at the access from left to right, the last 10 years of Libyan crude production. Now the country's crude production, if operating at, at close to maximum capacity, can be pumping kind of up at 1.6 million. However, at the moment they're pumping just 200,000. So it's one of the lowest rates that they've pumped, as you can see here, since going back eight years ago, essentially. Now, why is that happening? Well, civil unrest is the main thing. Ongoing conflict between the internationally backed Tripoli government and General uh, Khalifa Haftar, which has caused huge disruption to their ability to produce oil. However, these peace talks have been happening at the weekend. And one thing that a few people were talking about that I was reading was that if they can de-escalate this ongoing conflict in Libya, and that can lead back to more stable, calm conditions so that production rates can return back to some degree of normality. If you look at where we were on an average kind of price over 2019 trading or producing, it was about 1.2 million. So if you think about it, over the coming period then, and you can see these rates can change fairly rapidly, what if Libya starts to bring about 1 million barrels of crude oil back on the market? Now, we're talking about oil price, which has been whacked by 25% on the back of the uh, consumption loss out of China impacted by the outbreak of the virus, as we know. And prices have fallen um, down to this $50 uh, handle. The key thing I'm looking at here then is actually Libya might hold the key. Because if I flip over here, I know this is a bit, uh, I'll, I'll share with you the blog here so you can have a look at this in more detail. I did send it out to everyone this morning. But here, this is looking at oil over the last kind of two years. And one of the things that I'm looking at is last week we broke quite a key level of support, just above $50, which held a lot of the price action through the best part of 2019. Uh, we did briefly break that. However, when OPEC in their technical meetings last week started making some noises in toward cutting potentially the recommendation 600,000 barrels per day. Um, we, we started to see a little bit of stabilization in prices, but we're right back teetering on that level again. And I think if we do break it, then that does open kind of technically a bit of a, a trap door and we start seeing prices down at 47.50, 45, and that starts to bring in then that end of Q4 2018 low. Now the trigger point for this is at the moment OPEC seem a little reluctant to pull the trigger and we talked about this last week in terms of their strategy. They were kind of trying to verbally intervene last week. They haven't yet got to the point of actually cutting deeper supply. I don't think that they will unless we get that run down into the mid 40s. So if you start to see uh, headlines pertaining to Libya 
having some type of peace agreement and then tracking their numbers going north as they normalize their production rates, I think that could be just the tipping point then to add to this current bearish dynamic that we've got fundamentally in oil. And with a technical breach at these levels, that could be the key then for the move to, to the downside. Um, so something to just look out for this week. Going back to the, the calendar, um, as you can see for today, it's pretty quiet overall. Uh, but Tuesday, things start to get a bit more interesting. We've got UK GDP, of course, people will be watching closely, uh, just given how some of the other economic data has performed since the uh, initial election bounce, if you like, that we've had in some indicators. Um, but we get the first of a two-day significant platform for the Fed chair. So anyone new to markets, the Fed chairman, Jerome Powell, testifies before the, um, the House Financial Committee um, on Tuesday and then um, to the Senate Banking Committee on Wednesday. And the event in itself historically has often been seen as a significant staging post for the, uh, the head of the Fed to say about what they feel about current economic conditions and also future policy decisions. Now, the two events are basically a, a copy paste repeat of each other. So by default, then the Tuesday one, when he says it for the first time in terms of his opening statement, which will be already known by the major accredited press. So you'll get that whole batch of headlines hit the news wires on Tuesday afternoon. Um, that will be the most important one. And one of the key things, of course, will be does he add any more color as to the impact of the, the virus on the overall global perspective of, uh, of where we're heading in the future. Um, going further forward then, other things we're looking out for, you've got ECB's Christine Lagarde, uh, the president speaking on Tuesday uh, in European Parliament, and that does come ahead of Friday, which is gonna be a key day for European data, because for the second quarter in three, the German economy is expected to be in contraction. And this will also then see the preliminary Eurozone GDP figure as well. So that's on Friday. Now, from other data points of interest, really on back on Friday again, you've got US retail sales, industrial manufacturing production, and Michigan consumer sentiment, the preliminary reading, all also happening um, on Friday. From an earnings perspective, what do we have? Well, actually, I'd say earnings starts to almost completely drop off the main macro radar. I mean, for single stock traders, obviously still important. We're about 64% the way through of the S&P 500 reporting so far, but all of the big boys are kind of out of the way now. Uh, 65 companies will be reporting this week, but as you can see here is a glance of some of the most anticipated earning releases. Some of the biggest ones, I guess, uh, from, from an index weighting point of view, Alibaba Group, PepsiCo, Kraft, um, might be ones of interest. From a UK perspective on Friday, I think you've got Astra and RBS, uh, and you've got also Daimler, which were in the press this morning, the German uh, automotive name. I think they report on Tuesday pre-market, so tomorrow morning. But there was a headline out of the Handelsblatt this morning, they're cutting 15,000 jobs as part of a cost-cutting exercise. Remember, they've issued multiple profit warnings last year, so they look to kind of tighten the belt in that respect. Um, so yeah, that's that's the overall kind of uh, landscape for the week uh, from my side. So I'm going to use my my uh, safe word with Sam to know that he needs to swap now for him to come on, which is pineapples. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to leave you with that. So overall, a little bit of getting the week underway with um, a focus on the coronavirus. I honestly still don't think that that is a major issue at this point for markets again it's kind of one of those things where monday there's not a lot coming out on monday and also you get this kind of um, media fest over the weekend and because markets are closed you have a little bit of a gap down but we've already recovered that um, so it's something to monitor um, as we go through the week but otherwise you've got fed powell's testimony keep an eye on oil i think that could be a real interesting one this week just given where we're trading at the moment um, and then Christine Lagarde and, and some data points on Friday to look out for. Okay, guys, thanks very much. <laughs> thanks, and yeah, oil. I think will will certainly be 
uh, an interesting one this week if we just have a quick look where we're looking where we're trading at the moment just literally a, a couple of cent below 50 50 bucks on the futures uh, bring in last week into picture and if this is all you can see it's it's I would say pretty hard to, to form a, a picture of, of what's going to happen. It looks pretty range bound, doesn't it? If you look back on the beginning of, of last Monday, uh, the third, we, we basically hit that a couple of times along with some Friday before that resistance and those lows have, have come in and, and held quite well as well. So uh, you would perhaps favour, you know, from what we're seeing this morning and move down to the lows of last week. But overall, uh, it's going to be probably dictated from from OPEC and, and other comments that come through from that. Having a, a bit of a, a look, lower time frame into that, let's get the 15 minute in. Uh, what could we have for, for entries? I, I guess you can see from, let's just bring this trend line on, from uh, yesterday or Friday, I should say, uh, afternoon, early morning, then the afternoon, then this this early session today near the high you've got a nice trend line in the mix there three touches so a break of that might give you a bit of confidence that this move could push on and towards the pivot obviously looks like a, a pretty key point as well so that trend could be a bit of a guide to, to the upside to the downside well actually the level we just broke through here 50.09 uh, I know it's probably not the right time to be looking to trade oil uh, given the time and also the day uh, but that could be a bit of a, a short, shorter term resistance uh, and then obviously below, you're looking at the uh, the lower point we got to today, 49.56, which is basically the, the low that we had uh, from the year so far. And as we also know, if we do push lower, time to, to get on those uh, longer time frames and, and have a look at levels not seen since 2018 when oil uh, was just recovering a touch. But the next really, really key level for, for me that I like the look of, uh, I would have around 48.07 it was the low that we had on the futures anyway the 7th of Jan and, and just below there you've got uh, the high uh, 47.77 from the uh, what's that the, the 2nd of, of Jan as well so that's uh, some key support for me where uh, to be honest medium term little long uh, I don't think would be the, the worst idea in the world having a, a quick look elsewhere uh, European um, open eight o'clock. Let's have a quick look at the DAX. Choppy to start the week, perhaps a bit undecided. Uh, well, keeping a, I would say, a watch on that previous resistance that we did break through uh, around 130. So keep an eye on that 13,450, give or take. Also got a similar uh, trend to how oil was set up. That we we got levels from Friday. This just happens to be in the afternoon, just guiding price down. So if you are bullish on stocks, uh, a push above those trends and the pivot could be the, the way to look at this. If we were to, to hold up around there, uh, quite a lot of support below, of course, where we have been trading uh, this morning. Uh, you can see any of these previous highs would certainly be uh, ones to, to keep an eye on. And that low that we had early hours this morning was also support back on the 5th as well. So some key levels to, to be aware of. Line in the sand, perhaps guiding price. Um, well, has been guiding price higher you'd say could well be these highs that we had on the 29th 30 if we broke through just uh, last week and then just above the, the S2 13,373 uh, decent price action around that area uh, a bit of a line in the sand for the bulls to defend and the bears to want to take over a break of that and then you'd be looking to, to target back down towards the 4th 5th uh, area where of course the vaccine uh, the cure uh, was released s p and the dow and, and the nasdaq let's have a quick look as well you can see it's going to bring the, the dow in and, and this was a level i was looking to get long friday afternoon and of course it happens in the the early hours of, of sunday night uh, monday morning and, and bounces 100 and the rest points but uh, you know we move let's have a, a quick look in more intraday you can see it's again the trend from uh, Friday, that's just guiding price. It's not necessarily the most perfect trend line as of yet, uh, but if I was bullish, I want that to break and I want to see a nice push, ideally in the afternoon, for, for that to, to take place. 29,000, uh, the psychological handle, decent price action there. Friday, already just tested it now, so for a bit of support uh, in line in the sand, that's as, as good as any. Uh, a break of the low that we see today, and then I'll be looking down to the the cure 
uh, around 28,756. Since then, has been on a bit of a downward spiral after peaking uh, in the early hours of, of Thursday. But again, you can see this trend. We had a little false break uh, around 1.30 on Friday after uh, non-farm payrolls. But let's have a quick look here uh, as a, an area you would want to see to break if you're overall bullish. So to the upside, you've got the little trend line that we're in here. Uh, and then around 29,185 uh, would be pretty key uh, for me to want to wanna, uh, to see break if, I, if I'm going to get long. The pound this morning just drifted lower. Poor week last week. Having a look on the 240, you can see pretty much uh, from the, the off that you had those comments over over the weekend from, from Boris, which really dampened uh, the, uh, the mood for pound bulls. And we're, of course, now let's get that daily chart out. We closed the week below some of the key support, which had been guiding price. You can see here, nice break below. We uh, are perhaps now looking to extend it down towards 128. That's an area I'd be looking for. Uh, not the biggest move to start the day, uh, but when, when the volume starts to look to come back in, you know that's uh, a move where you could be targeting down to that 128 handle. If you're bullish, the old false break, push above 129.39 is, is an option. Um, however, I wouldn't be too sure that that's uh, going to take place just yet. So pound, I think certainly to begin the week anyway, uh, would be favouring uh, a move uh, to the downside. Euro, um, well, let's have a, a quick look. You definitely want to have some of these uh, longer term horizontal, what was support, now resistance levels on. You can see the amount of times we tested it, October, November. Uh, and then again here on the future, so keep a watch on that. Should we come back to test it? If not, then you are looking at those lows from last year uh, as well. So the euro under a bit of pressure. Let's have a look now on that 60 minute just to identify some of these areas that I would look to have on. If we were to just recover a touch, R1 looks very key, not just intraday, but going forward as well. You've got the high there from Friday afternoon and of course that longer term support level as well. Pivot has acted as a bit of uh, resistance as it did so many times yet uh, last week you can see early hours friday almost hitting it thursday the same wednesday tuesday and then on the break of that on monday so it's a good guide for the price uh, if we were to come up there again just keep a watch on that and how it trades if you're looking for that continuation of course the break of of uh, friday's lows is another option uh, of that i would still be looking overall to get short but keeping an eye on the dollar as well of course which is uh, at levels not seen for quite some time. Aussie dollar, let's have a quick look. Of course, that broke um, some key uh, support last week, having had a decent bounce from the similar level. So keep a watch on that. We did close on the futures below those levels from August last year. Uh, and as we put this on the, the longer time frame, if we are to continue lower, well, let me just remove the pivots just to show you where the next level of support could be. And you're looking down near the financial crisis of 2008. And really, I'd say the next technical level, the high of the week of the 9th of March 2009 at uh, 66.05. Whether that's a target you want to get in right now or not, I'm, I'm not too sure. Uh, but let's have a look at the 60 minute just to, to hold some of these levels in with the pivots. You can see, well, we're just testing that pivot now. I guess early hours probably waiting for the break of that to continue to go short. First test of it after breaking through. Uh, it's holding up the zone, of course, have not broken there. So, uh, you know, the pivot was to break close below, targeting uh, the lows of Friday. And, well, I don't necessarily think we get the 66.05 level today. But uh, as your line in the sand goes, if we were to close uh, even, I guess, an hourly again below all this area of support, you've got to be a seller in my book. Just uh, a word of warning if it does push lower, just be aware that could of course be this trend line that comes in to play around there as well have a quick look at gold just to, to finish it up starting the week positive drifting lower um as uh, asian stocks just recovered initially keep a watch on see on that high of the the day it was also a level back uh, on tuesday morning similar time uh, so keep a uh, a point marked up for that we did have of course the the, the break lower yesterday uh, last week i should say for gold and just bringing in that trend line here that broke through you can see we we tested it all through what would have been Thursday Friday spikes after there on 
the uh, non-farm payrolls, the, the jobs report, and, and really that's a, a trend line I would be looking to move and just identifying a couple new ones near those bottoms from uh, the fifth. You can see you've got your one, two, three tests. So if you're bearish, just wait for that to break. Uh, and I would say this R1 is, is a good line in the sand uh, as you will need. And if that is to push on and, and break through the highs of the third, etc., cetera, uh, are where you'd be looking for. Uh, just be keeping an eye on, on, on stocks here. Uh, which have just touched lower a bit and obviously with oil going down stocks going down your safe havens just catching a bit as well could see a, a little flurry through to start the week but you know monday uh, not expecting you know necessarily fireworks on the uh, the calendar highlights front it's along with thursday the probably the quietest day uh, so just uh, just be careful out there you know want those confirmations uh, bigger things to, to come this week Hope you all have a good one. Speaking of that and any questions, please do let us know uh, and I'll catch you all later on.